do. You know what happens? You suddenly can be depended on. <laughs> and a child knows I can trust my mom to do what she says. I can trust my dad. Now, my daughter and I spoke once and did a seminar together. And I was real surprised because she said, and I heard her when she said this in public, she said, I used to pout a lot. I said, Amen. <laughs> and she said, that's how I used to try to get my mother to change her mind. And she said, you know, when I was unhappy long enough, my mother would change her mind. And I would get my way. She said, but, but this man came along and taught my mother that that was wrong and that my mother shouldn't change her mind because of what I did. And she said, my mother quit doing that. And she said, at first, it frustrated me a lot. But she said, you see, pretty soon I became real secure in our relationship because I didn't control her anymore. She controlled me. And I thought, well, isn't that good? Now, I didn't teach her that. What insight <laughs> she had. And I began to see that when, you know, what does it mean to be dependable? It means that you can depend on what somebody says. And, you know, there really aren't a whole lot of people in life you can depend on. Have you ever thought about that? And it seems to me that the more progressive we get and the more educated we become, the fewer people you can trust. The fewer people that will do what they say. Now, if a child is going to be secure at home, which is what counts, then the mom and dad need to be dependable. Or if you're just a single mom, even more so. Uh, my daughter said when she got her divorce, um, my children are no longer from a broken home. <laughs> They are now from a mended home because there was so much chaos. And I am against divorce, I want to say. I want to go on record. I am for marriage. But I'll tell you, there are times for the sake of peace that you need to, you need to separate. And there was so much chaos in her house and so much turmoil and so much just uncertainty. And so she said, nobody will ever say my children are from a broken home because I will provide the love and I will provide the security that they need. And you know, they go with their dad every two weeks. And I remember the first time they came home, they walked in and the little five-year-old was crying. And she said, what's the matter? And he said, oh, well, I miss my dad. <laughs> and when I'm with my dad, I miss you. And when I'm with you, I miss my dad. And I'm sitting there thinking, oh, what do we do? What do we do? And you know, she just wheeled around and looked at that little boy and she said, oh, his name is Mark. And he said, she said, Mark, I'm so proud of you. You are doing so good. You're supposed to love your dad and you're supposed to love me. And you're doing it. <laughs> That's wonderful, Mark. And I watched that little five-year-old look at her and say, really? <laughs> and he just jumped up and ran out and rode his bike. And really, she's not put the child between she and her ex-husband. Oh, here he comes. Go have a good time. Love him. Oh, what a sad thing to see when parents start using the kids and pitting them against one another. What a sad thing for a marriage to break up. I mean, it's just terrible. And having lived with it in my own family, I now see the disaster. And just because it's happened to me, I sure don't put my stamp of approval on it. But there are times you have to. And so you need to keep the kids out of the middle. And your children need to be disciplined. By the same token, one day little Gil came home from school and he was crying and he said, Mama, why do I have to wear hearing aids? He said, nobody else wears hearing aids. And the kids were making fun of him. And my daughter turned around and she said, because you can't hear. He said, well, why can't I hear? Because you got sick and you lost your hearing. You know, she said, Gail, I wear glasses. You know why I wear glasses? I can't see. <laughs> you wear hearing aids because you can't hear. And he said, oh, <laughs> okay. And you know, that's just been fine. And now he has a little girlfriend, and she came and told her daddy 
that she was going to marry Gil, and she was going to have red-headed kids that wore hearing aids. <laughs> Isn't that great? Now the kids think it's wonderful that, God, he's the only one in the room that wears hearing aids. You know, we don't need to worry about all this psychology with all these kids. Just tell them the truth. They can take the truth a lot better than you think. They had discipline. Discipline is that you tell them what to do and you get up. Now, what can you expect out of kids? Let me tell you what you can expect out of kids. Resistance. <laughs> Children are going to resist authority. How do we know that? The Bible tells us so. What does the Bible say? All we like sheep have gone astray. Each is what? Each is turned to his own way. Now, is your child an all? Huh? Sure, your child's a person. And God has told you exactly what to expect out of that child. Now, you get what you expect, you know. <laughs> and if you expect resistance, you just got what you expected. And so it's no big deal. Now, resistance brings up the challenge. Who's going to win? Who's going to win? Well, the one in authority is going to win, right? Yes. Sure, the one in authority is going to win. So, you be in authority, and when resistance comes, remember what's inside of you? Love, patience, kindness, gentleness, meekness. And so you meet resistance with love in your heart. <laughs> and you say, sure, I know you don't like this. You don't have to like it. You just have to do it. <laughs> you know, I can remember saying, Mark, go cut the grass. Well, why do I always have to cut the grass? I hate to cut the grass. Why don't you ever get Sam to cut the grass? I have to cut the grass all the time. I don't want to cut the grass. I remember what freedom when I said, Mark, you don't have to like to cut the grass. You're free to cut it mad or glad. I don't care. <laughs> just get out there and cut it. <laughs> And, you know, it took all the pressure off the relationship, and he'd go out there mad. Just cut it fast, because he was mad. I was kind of glad he was mad. He got through with it. But, you know, he'd come in to get a drink of water, and he'd say, Hey, Mom, it looks good, doesn't it? He felt good, because he'd been obedient. And I'll tell you something. There's just something about being obedient that feels good. You talk about self-confidence with kids. You know how to build self-confidence and have a good self-esteem when the child does what's right. <laughs> when you do what's right, you feel good about yourself. And we have fallen for a lot of garbage that says we've got to build them up. We've got to get them involved in scouts and dancing and be sure they have all these opportunities. That don't change your heart. You know what changes your heart? When you set the limits... Love the kid, give them security. And you make them do what they're supposed to do. Then they don't have anything to hide <laughs> or to be ashamed of. Now, I want to give you two words that I think are really important in parenting. You need to have confident expectations. Parents need confident expectations because that gives you the conviction to carry out the plan that you set out. Now, what do we mean by confident expectations? Okay, remember you're an authority, and you've talked to your child and read to your child and listened to your child, and you know what your child needs. Now, nobody else knows what your child needs. And if you have noticed, or if you will notice, please, I have not told you specifics of what you ought to do with your child, because I don't know your child. And I don't know what limits need to be set. I don't know what you need to tell your child to do. But you're the authority, and so you know. Confidence comes when you know that the limits you've set are the best thing for your child. And what you're doing is exactly what they need. Now, that gives you confidence. Now, because you're the authority and you got love in your heart and you're patient and kind, you expect to win. <laughs> right? Yes. 
Now, why do you want to win? Because you're doing what's best for the child. So, you want to parent your child with confident expectation. And once you have that confidence that I'm doing what's right. Now, what's best for your child is that he be disciplined. Now, I'm not talking about what he, what he does. I don't care what he does. But what I care about is that when you tell him to do something, you're going to see to it that he does it. Now, what about punishment? Well, let's, let's don't use the word punishment. Let's use the word pressure. You need to put pressure on your child to overcome resistance. Now, listen carefully to this. Reasoning never overcomes resistance. Now, have you ever seen somebody or have you ever sat in and reasoned with your child and said, let me tell you why you're supposed to do this. <laughs> now, like, Mommy wants to explain this to you. You know what that child's looking at you like, you idiot? Yes. I don't care to hear all this lecture. You know, I think we talk entirely too much to our children. I remember my husband said to me one time, Mary Glenn, you got two ears and one mouth, and you ought to use it in that proportion. <laughs> you know, you say, one time you will do this. Now, when do you apply pressure? When they seek to defy your authority. Now, I don't believe that you ought to ever touch your child in anger. But the problem is that usually they've tried our patience and tried our patience and we've let them build up, build up until we are so mad that we go out and we strike them in anger. And that's child abuse. And I am certainly against that. Because you see, the one thing children need to learn is that all of their behavior bears a consequence. And when you teach that to your child, you have taught them a lesson that will send them out into the world to be a success. Because all behavior bears a consequence. And you know, in America, we are a nation of, we want to fix it. We want to fix it for our kids. You know, they get caught, we want to blame somebody else. Uh, they do wrong, we want to excuse their behavior. Don't ever do that. Let them bear the consequences for their behavior as they grow up. You know, you do this, this is the result. You obey mommy, um, you get all sorts of rewards. <laughs> you disobey, I can't reward bad behavior. Uh, I remember I said once to my little grandson, you know, I can't reward your bad behavior. I just can't do it. Well, I have to tell you, this is a real funny story. I went to pick my child up, my grandchild up, and he came out of the school and he had his books and his papers and he dropped them. He was in kindergarten. And he picked them all up, but he left one little piece of paper. And I said, Mark, you forgot that. And he said, I don't need that. Now he's in kindergarten. He's five years old. And I said, yeah, go get that. So he picked it up, and I watched him. He got in the back seat, and I saw him fold it up, you know. And we went over to see my mother, and he stuck it in a fern. So I figured there must be something interesting about that piece of paper. So while he was getting the cookie, I went down and got the piece of paper. It said to, to my daughter, it said, uh, Mark has not been resting, and he is disturbing the other children. And I have told him that if he doesn't rest, I'm going to remove his privileges. And so I thought, well, here's my daughter going through a divorce. You know, she's struggling. So I'll take over, and I'll try to help in this situation. And so I put Mark in the car and took him home, and I said, now, Mark, um, I read your note. He said, are you going to tell my mom? I said, no, I'm not going to tell you, Mom. But I said, you know, Mark, uh, you haven't been resting in school and your teacher's going to remove your privileges. I said, now, Mark, you know you can't. You stay here, and when you're a good boy and you want to go to the toy store, I take you. And if you're a bad boy and you say, I want to go to the toy store, I say, Mark, I don't reward bad behavior. I said, now, that's what the teacher's trying to say to you. 
And I said, so if you don't rest, she's going to remove your privileges. And this little five-year-old boy looked up at me, and he said, he calls me Mima, and he says, Mima, is that part of my body? <laughs> <laughs> and I just fell over laughing. I said, oh, no, Mark. <laughs> And so that just reminds me that you got to be sure they understand what you're talking about. I mean, hear this poor child. No wonder he hid the note. He was losing his privileges. Whatever that was. <laughs> okay. So gentle pressure overcomes resistance. Now, I say gentle pressure because, you see, you need to be prepared, and you start with light pressure, and you increase it as slowly as possible because you always want somewhere to go. Now, if you apply pressure to your children too intense, you know what's going to happen to them? You're going to run them away. You know, you just press down on something and it squishes out, doesn't it? You press down on your garbage and it just goes, if it doesn't have a good container, it'll just go all over the place. That's what happens to your kids. So when you apply real severe pressure, they're just going to scoot right out and leave you. You don't ever want to do that. But you do have to apply pressure, whatever kind you're comfortable with. Because children need to experience pressure from a loving mom or a loving dad. And then you see, if they go out and break the law and the police stops them, this is not a new experience to them. And some kids, when they break the law for speeding or stop sign or traffic light and then the police comes and gives them a ticket they don't know what pressure is they've never had to bear a consequence and so what do they do they defy the law and they say nobody tells me what to do i'll show you and whose fault is it all right one final thing and then we'll take another break here you need, as a parent, to have a quick reverse. Now, this is something that, that lifesavers at a swimming pool or at the beach, the first thing they have to learn is a quick reverse. Now, the lifeguard sits up in the tower, and what's he doing? He's guarding the life of all the people. Now, he sees these kids over here learning to swim. And they're right there on the side of the pool, and they're swimming away. Now, he's not about to get involved. And they may struggle, and they may try to swim, and they go under, but they come up and grab the side of the pool. So what's the lifeguard do? He just sits there and watches them struggle. Now, when does he get to his feet and enter the water? When he sees danger, right? When he sees danger, he goes in. Now, when a person is out there in the middle of the pool or out in the ocean and drowning and struggling, you know what? He's panicked. And so here comes the lifeguard to rescue somebody who's struggling. And what's the first danger the lifeguard faces? That the struggling person will sink the lifeguard. And so when he approaches him and he realizes that that struggling person that drowning victim who is panicked reaches out, he has to have a quick reverse and back away. <laughs> and then he has to approach again. And if his life is in danger, then he backs away too. Now, as a parent, you have to beware that you never let your child sink you. And you know when your child will sink you? When you become bitter selfish, hostile, rebellious, because you got a child out there that needs protecting. You got a child out there that's panicked, that's struggling. <laughs> and when you go out to rescue him, if you go out a hostile, rebellious, screaming, antagonistic, selfish, bitter mom or dad, then that child will take you right down to the bottom. So you have to know when to pull away and when to reapproach. And when to pull away and reapproach. Because what's the goal of a lifeguard? Tell me, come on. To save the life 
of the swimmer. And I consider parents as lifeguards, and the kids are swimming in a world that's going to sink them. You know, I'm soon going to be 61 years old. I can't believe I'm so old. Oh, I'm going to be dead soon. Mm -hmm. But when I was a little girl, we just didn't have to face all the things the kids face today. I never heard of drugs. I mean, marijuana and heroin and cocaine and crack and LSD, I never heard of it. And, and nobody slept around when I was a kid. At least, I didn't know about it. I mean, you just didn't do that when I was a little girl. And I just have to tell you, I thank God that he brought me into time in 1931. Because if he had brought me into time in 1961, I'd have been out there trying everything. I mean, I was one who loved people and party and fun and let's try it all. But the things I tried didn't kill you. <laughs> you know, I mean, I just, you know, we'd smoke a cigarette, hide in the bush and smoke a cigarette. One time I hid a bottle of gin. Hid it out in the, on a dirt road and my friends and I went out there and dug it up to taste it. And it tasted so bad that we just about gagged. And that's just about the worst thing I ever did. Can you believe that? And I look at all these kids today. You know what they face? Let me tell you what the kids of today face. Death. Early death. End to their life. Why? Because there's so much free sex in the world today. And everybody says it's okay. And you know, we got some plagues that there's no cure for. And I'm not trying to persuade you of anything, except I'm just telling you the facts. And, and there are a lot of diseases. If you don't like the word plague, call them diseases, that these kids are going to have because they've been left to make a decision. And they're doing what seems right to them. And drugs, oh, I just can't believe what drugs are doing to our society. And do you know that drugs is a big business and there are there are people that are making millions of dollars selling drugs you think they're not gonna they're gonna quit you think they care they don't care they just want the money and so how are we ever gonna change society it's gonna take us about 20 years to change things and where are we gonna start with that little baby that little baby in that crib and it's going to take about 20 to 25 years but when you get to be my age that's suddenly in so long <laughs> after all now your child needs to know that um, there are consequences to his behavior and see if you bring them up that way you say to them okay you go you go sleep around here's here's what you might get you see you go smoke pot, and pretty soon you want to you want to move up into crack, into cocaine, and it costs a lot of money, and you get addicted, and you can't get out of it, and and pretty soon you go rob a store because you got to have the money, or you get involved in drug trafficking, and and your life is over. Mm -hmm. yes, but if they've never had to pay a price for their behavior, you you can't reach them. And let me tell you, you don't start doing this when they're sixteen. See, for those of you that might see this video and you got teenagers, um, you, you don't start doing all this. There. It's too hard on them. You, you start with what you can, but you can't with the intensity that you can if you're bringing them up from the crib. Every time a baby is born, it's unique and it's one of a kind. And it ought to be a privilege to raise a one-of-a-kind child <laughs> because value is placed on supply and if we have a child that cannot be replaced how are you going to put a value on that child's life if you can't replace it you can't put a value on it so we need to realize that when we commit ourselves to parenthood it's one of the most privileged exciting jobs anybody can ever have and it ought to be fun, and it ought to be exciting. Because you see, it's filled with challenges. <laughs> and when you don't have any challenge, 
What fun is it? You know, people get bored when they don't have a challenge. Yes. And life becomes mundane and humdrum, and you say, oh, I'm so bored, I just can't believe i got to go face another day. Well, believe me, raising kids there and them, no days like that. <laughs> and so we want to first be sure that we are parents that have love in our heart. And love comes from God. That's where it comes from. And when you're loving, you're kind and patient and gentle. You hardly notice when others do you wrong, and you always succeed. Now, when you raise children, uh, you love them, you give them security, and that means you as the parent set the limits. You set the limits based on what you know about your child. You see, a parent needs to be an authority on their children. That means you study them, you research them, you spend time with them, you know their needs, you know their talents, you know their gifts, you know their weaknesses, you know their strengths. And so every child's different. And if you have two children, three children, five children, there might be five sets of limits. <laughs> and just because you do for one, you don't have to do that for another one. But you set the limits according to the needs and the abilities and the personalities and the talents of every child. And then the one comes along and says, well, you let her do that and you don't let me. You say, that's because I'm the boss. <laughs> See, that's because you don't decide what you do, I do. And you know what that gives that child? Great security. Because you see, I can depend on my mom, I can depend on my dad to do what's best for me. Because I'm unique. I went to a church meeting this past week, and there was a wonderful black pastor there. He was from New Jersey, and he spoke, and he said, when I was in the sixth grade, my sixth grade teacher said to me, you'll never get out of high school. You'll end up in jail someday. He said, you know, that was a terrible thing for your sixth grade teacher to say. He said, but I want to tell you all, she was wrong. <laughs> he said, because you see, God looked down and saw the possibilities in me. And God just picked me right up and helped me develop the possibilities that He gave me. And you know, it broke my heart again as I left that church because I thought, that's what we need to do with all of our children. We need to look for the possibilities in them. Don't condemn them and put them down. And by the way, this, this pastor, he's the pastor of a church up in New Jersey. His teacher was a Roman Catholic. And he said, do you know that not long ago I was invited to the White House to meet the Pope? And he said, I took my invitation and I copied it on a copying machine and I sent it to my teacher. And I said, dear teacher, your president invited me to meet your Pope. <laughs> I'm not in jail. Isn't that good? Isn't that great? So we don't ever need to cause defeat there's enough people to defeat our kids. And we need to look for all the wonderful possibilities. And you know we need to let children be what they are. And one of the biggest problems we as parents face is that we have our little plan for what they need to be. And we try to make them fit into our little mold. And we need to just study and research and spend time to see what, what they're capable of doing. And then we need to encourage them. And you know if it's digging a ditch... <laughs> Dig the best ditch you can possibly dig. If it's being a teacher, be the best teacher. Whatever it is, we want to instill in them that it's so it, they need to do the best. Now, we need to give children a helping hand. And that, that's part of discipline. You give them a helping hand. If you tell them to do something, you help them do it. But remember, that cuts into your time. <laughs> That's going to take your time away from doing what you want to do. And you've got to be willing to sacrifice your time and your energy to help your child. Now, a helping hand redirects unacceptable behavior. That's where you start. Now, we were just talking about a child that doesn't like, you know, wants to do all these things they can't do. Well, don't just go in there and say, no, you can't stop redirect their attention to something they can do. You know, instead of a child that's standing there having a fit, 
Don't go over there and punish them and put the pressure on them when they're having a fit. Go pick them up and give them a hug and go show them the flower. <laughs> go show them the light. Go get them a drink of lemonade. Do something to get their mind off. And then you know what? They'll probably go right back to what they were doing. <laughs> and you say, this bullheaded, stubborn kid, don't say that. Say, boy, I got a good, determined young child. And I'm going to see to it that he is determined to succeed at something worthwhile in life. Instead of saying, what am I going to do with this stubborn kid? Say, oh boy, wait till he grows up. <laughs> He'll be the finest there is. So a helping hand redirects unacceptable behavior. A helping hand gives help as it's needed. Now remember, the lifeguard, you don't... You don't jump in when the struggling child is safe and struggling to learn to swim. When do you jump in and rescue the child? At the first sign of what? Danger. Danger. And so a parent decides when to give the help. You need to give more help than is needed. Be sure you give more help than the child needs. You prepare in advance to give help. You think about it. Okay, I got a, we say stubborn, bullheaded, strong-willed child. Now, you better be up on what you can do <laughs> to distract that child from things he can't do. So you spend time preparing yourself to see the child happily through the day. A helping hand applies the right amount of pressure at the right time and increases it as slowly as possible. <coughs> okay. Um, in conclusion, I want to talk about the possible dream. <laughs> it is possible to enjoy life every day. That is a possible dream. Now that doesn't mean you won't have Trials, tribulation, disappointments. That, that, won't mean, that doesn't mean that everything's going to always go your way. But you know, when you put your faith in God, and you know that God loves you. Remember the 23rd Psalm? You ever learned that? The Lord is my shepherd. What does a shepherd do? Tends the, Tends the sheep. Takes care of the sheep. And you know, I want to say something else. I don't know what love looks like. I don't know what love looks like. You know, you can be the meanest liar in the world and do things that look nice. You can be a deceitful, selfish person and be so nice to get your way. So I don't know what love looks like. I know what love is. Love is kind. And love is patient. And love desires the best for others. Therefore, love never accepts bad behavior. Never. So what do you do? Well, you act like a lady. And you excuse yourself from someone whose behavior is not correct. Or if it's your child, you get up and put a stop to it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let me, just one moment. Hey, hey, hey. I asked y'all to stop this noise, okay? I'm on the phone talking. Now, you're supposed to be polite when I'm on the phone. Don't you know that? Okay. Thank you. So you can enjoy every day of your life. And when the troubles come and the trials and the heartaches and the disappointments as have surely come in my life, and the tears flow and they will, and your heart feels like it's just going to fall right out of your feet, <laughs> down to your feet. That's the time you say, thank you, Lord. I can trust you in this. And I can trust you to guide me and lead me and direct me. And I can trust you to comfort me. And I don't understand this. I don't like this. But I just want to thank you that you are a loving God who is in control.
Now, let me say, if that's your attitude, you have accepted God as the authority in your life. You may not like the path He takes you. You may not like the things that happen to you. But you've accepted His authority. And I want to warn you, if as a parent you don't cause your child to come under your authority, you make it awful hard for him to come under the authority of a God that he never sees. And some of the hardest kids to reach for the Lord are those who've had no love and no supervision by a parent. I had one young man say to me, if you tell me that God wants to be my father, I'm not interested because I've had all the father I want. He had a father that was wealthy and educated and prominent but never gave him the time of day but would write a check and say, what do you want? Go get it. Leave me alone. And he's not interested. And so when you as a loving mom and a loving dad discipline your child, set the limits, you're preparing your child to move out from under your authority and easily come under the authority of God. Be unselfish and be considerate. Now, the job description of a parent. Taking care of children is a long, hard, demanding, rewarding job. You know, the reward I had for raising Mark? Do you remember? You know what my reward was? A big old hug. <laughs> Not a word, but a big old hug. And he just had a, his wife had a baby, you know, about three months ago. And I was in another city, and I got a call one morning at about 6 o'clock. And it was Mark, 32 years old. You know what he said? He said, hey, Mom, come home. <laughs> what do you mean, come home? Come home, Mom. Why? Baby's coming. Boy, I got in my car, and I drove home. I had to drive back that afternoon, but I drove home as fast as I could. And I walked in that hospital just in time for him to come out and tell me, Mom, it's a girl. And then he went back, and he didn't say anything else to me. He went back and stayed with his wife. That's where he should have been. I said, well, God, that's, you drove all that way for that? You better believe it. That was my reward. <laughs> he, he didn't need me anymore. But he just wanted to look me in the face and say, Mom, it's a girl. Or, Mom, it's a boy. <laughs> That was my reward. And that was a great reward. It wasn't much to you, maybe. Oh, it was a lot to me. What if he didn't want to hug me? What if he didn't care whether I showed up or not? And I'll tell you, if I had been a witch like I started out being as a mother, I'm sure he would have been hoping I didn't show up at the hospital. So I just let him tell me, and I got in my car and drove back. <laughs> So parenting is a long, hard, demanding, rewarding job. Parents need to, in their job description, consider children as a primary responsibility, not an interruption. And in today's economy, today's world, we've got hundreds, thousands of single moms who have to go to work. And that doesn't mean you neglect your child. But what it means is that you take the responsibility to see that your child is well cared for. And I'll tell you what, if you love your child and give them security, you can drive up to a daycare and drop them off. And they're fine. Because they know you're coming back. <laughs> and it's just okay. So being responsible doesn't mean if you are in that situation that you can't go out and support yourself, you can't go out and get a job, but it's when you're with the child, you give them that love and security, and you investigate where you leave them, and you look into that, and you study that, and you know they're in a good place where they're going to be well 
cared for. You've got to know that guiding children should never be something that interferes with your personal life, but it's a great part of it. The wholesome parent never bemoans the job, but relishes it. And I'm reading this because I want to say it the way I wrote it. The wholesome parent never bemoans the job, but relishes it. Half the battle is accepting the task and the never-ending surprises and frustrations that children bring to the job. <laughs> Remember? Half the battle is accepting the task and the never-ending surprises and frustrations that children bring to the job. My children are grown. My grandchildren are on the scene. And my lays are still filled with frustrations, surprises, <laughs> announcements. In fact, I'm leaving tomorrow. I'm going away for four days vacation and then do some seminars. And I can't wait to get out of here. <laughs> I'm going to go prop my feet up and stare out into space for four days. <laughs> and I'm not leaving a forwarding address or a phone number. Because for four days, I don't want to hear any more problems. <laughs> but I thank God I can be here for them because they still need me because they know I love them. So God bless you all and richly reward you as you seek to accept the responsibility of a demanding, hard job. Thank you.